Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Antioch Church of the Brethren's Front Lawn. It's great to have uh, so many of you out there. Great to see some faces. And I feel like we're, we're spreading out, covering more of the shaded area. So that's great, right? We have this amazing um, privilege to have this space to use, right? And other churches would love to have it. So I'm glad that we are making use of it. Uh, Today is the last day of our summer series. We've been talking about God calling, the ways that God beckons us, invites us, uh, sends us out to whatever mission, service, opportunity to love there might be. If we were in a different setting, I might invite you all to participate in some sort of responsive action at the end of this series, some, some way to explore the specific callings that maybe you have felt, or to spend some time considering those little nudge feelings that we get. As it is, I encourage each of you to take responsibility for doing some of that yourselves with your friends and your families. What has God's call been like for you? Do you sense the call as a feeling? A pushing or pulling inside? Drawing you to something? Do you sense God's call in the the words of others around you? As they notice particular gifts or talents that you might have? And suggest, hey, have you ever thought about doing this with it? Last week we looked at the call stories of several of Jesus' closest disciples. But there were many others out there that experienced an invitation from Jesus to something new. To change, to serve, to grow. This is one of those stories from Luke 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I'm glad most of us are sitting because it means that I assume everyone has a good view of the trailer up here. No one is straining their neck to try to see over anybody else, right? No one's having to climb a tree. These would be difficult trees to climb to get a good view. Most of us, when we hear about the city of Jericho, immediately think of what? Jericho. The walls come tumbling down, right? Jericho is known as that city that the Israelite armies surrounded and God destroyed the walls so that Israel could attack early in the Old Testament. But here we have Jesus entering Jericho roughly a thousand years later. Yet Jericho still has that story hanging over it. Its past looms in the background. You know how certain places, something happened there a long time ago, but we still think of it every time we think of that place. Think of a a battlefield or a place where there was some climactic event. In Jericho, we meet Zacchaeus, a wee little man who is drawn to Jesus but can't seem to see over the heads of all these tall people around him. He was staturally impaired. He was short. So he climbs a tree to get a better view, as any of us would. Now, sometimes being up in a tree is a great place to see without being seen, right? We might find a good hiding spot somewhere up high, be able to eavesdrop a little bit. 
But Jesus, as usual, sees Zacchaeus. Jesus manages always to see and know those who often go unseen by others. Now, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And if you remember from last week, we talked about another tax collector named Matthew, whom Jesus called to follow him. One who was popularly despised by the people because tax collectors took people's money on behalf of the villainous Roman Empire and often skimmed a bit off the top to fill their own pockets. Yet here is Jesus not only seeing Zacchaeus, not only knowing his interest and his pull, but inviting himself over for dinner. How hospitable of Jesus. I'm coming for dinner. What you making me? Now, no good, reputable, respectable Jew at that time would be caught dead, socializing, hanging out with, sharing a meal with a tax collector. But Jesus doesn't really care about being reputable or respectable. And he publicly declares for all to hear that he is going over to Zacchaeus' house for dinner today. So remember the story of Jericho's walls falling down? Here they are. Jesus, God's representative on earth, breaks down walls. In this case, walls of social division and hatred and prejudice. Sometimes those kinds of walls are harder to tear down than brick and stone. Fear and hate are strong with deep roots extending far into all cultures, gripping a hold of us in ways that we don't even know about. There's a message here for we who are in the crowd. A message about love and welcome. A message about not only looking forward, but looking around to see who we're standing in the way of. There's also a message for those privileged with wealth and power. Those things cannot bring us closer to Jesus. Zacchaeus had money and the law on his side, but what good were they when he wanted to know Jesus more? Worthless. Jesus himself has to make a way for wealthy Zacchaeus to be welcome. Jesus is the barrier breaker in every way. Whatever walls you have blocking your way to love, to life, to peace, Jesus is looking to smash him down somehow if we let him. Last week, I also mentioned the history of figs. Anyone remember that last week? We talked about fig trees and how figs are first mentioned in the Bible as a symbol of shame. When Adam and Eve try to cover themselves after they realize that they are sinners. Well, here Zacchaeus again seeks a way to see Jesus by climbing what kind of tree? A sycamore fig tree. Now, I was talking to my mom earlier this week, and she was really confused. She was like, I didn't realize figs could grow on sycamore trees. So we had to Google it, and we had to look it up, and apparently this is a thing. There are sycamore fig trees, especially in the Middle East. And Jesus says, get down from there. Stop trying to hide behind figs. Stop trying to hide your shame. Make room for me at your table, Zacchaeus, by your side, in your heart. And Zacchaeus is a changed man, transformed. He was called. And in response, Zacchaeus started giving his money away. Here at Antioch, we are called as well. We have a We have a vision, the kind of church family and community that we are called to be. We have a mission, a purpose, a goal, not just to gather and to have friends in this lovely place, but to serve the world around us, to seek Jesus and help others to draw near to him. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's calling for you.
Now respond and say, you going to answer that? You ever had that moment when the phone rings and everybody's kind of looking at each other like, who's going to pick that up? Because when God calls, sometimes it just rings and rings and rings, and we get so used to ignoring it that it almost fades into the background, you know? As a church, we support one another on our journeys of faith and life however we can. Sometimes it means reminding people to pick up the phone because God's calling. In other ways, we can support one another through prayer. And there are several things that we can lift up to God in support of each other. Of course, many of us are mourning the loss of Bill Chrisman, who passed away uh, just a day ago. And of course, he was a beloved man to many of us. I always remember walking down the aisle at the end of church services when we were inside, and he's usually the first person there on the pew, and he's usually smiling, giving me a thumbs up. I know I did. I got one person who still likes me. I know many of us will miss Bill, and we will celebrate his life more uh, in the days to come. We also remember... Ray Altus and family after the passing of his mother early this past week. Keep the Altuses in prayer. We want to remember all those who are particularly stressed and busy at this difficult time in our world, those who have to make hard decisions, and there are many who are needing to do so, many who are facing complications and just making life work out. We pray for better, more loving, more patient communication between peoples across walls of division. We pray for an end to acting out of fear. We remember this past week was the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We remember the tremendous cost of war and the times when all lives have not mattered to everyone in the past. May we learn from history, not in celebration, but in thoughtfulness and care for tomorrow. As we enter a time of prayer, I want to invite us to do a little something different since this is the end of our summer series. I want to ask that if you are able and willing, would you stand up as we pray? And we're going to be turning and facing different directions as we pray. One thing I didn't look up was somebody tell me which way is north. I, th I thought it was somewhere over there, right? So we're going to say that's north-ish. So if you would start facing that direction, as we pray, I will guide us through where to look. Let us pray. God of the earth, the sky, the seas, God of all creation and all peoples. God whose holy wind and spirit flow through all living things. We feel your breath inside us as well. We sense that we are loved and we are called to love in return. Not only you, but our neighbors, strangers, and enemies. Spirit of God, we, we welcome quiet and stillness surrounded by the garden of your creation. We thank you for the north, for the snow and cold seasons you send so that we may rest and be renewed. We pray for all the people of the north. We turn to the west. Spirit of God, we welcome rain and the harvest of food that comes from your earth for those that work it. We pray for the people of the west. 
we turn south. Spirit of God, we welcome warmth and energy. We thank you for light and summer and excitement. We pray for the people of the South. And we turn to the East. Spirit of God, we welcome the rising sun and every new day. We thank you for the wind that you send over the earth and the new life that flows around and within us. We pray for the people of the East. We come back together facing you in every direction and place, within and without. Spirit, flow through our worship today. Receive us as we receive you. Be our vision and our life. Call to us now and we shall arise today to go and serve and follow wherever you lead, wherever your wind takes us. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Yes. For the beauty of the summer day and the comfort of friends. For the invitation to love and be loved. For our God who extends that call. For time set apart to nourish the soul. For time to go out into the world armed with love. For all these things we give thanks. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. Dear Lord and Father, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon us, each of us. We ask that you open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. For our opening hymn, if you've brought your hymnal, it is number 545. If you have your electronic device, it should have been emailed to you earlier today. Please join with us in Be Thou My Vision.
There are many signs we claim for our faith, but ultimately, it is our active love that reveals who we worship. Give of your talents and material possessions to the church with the expectation that they be used for further dream to further God's dream for our world. Please commit yourself and give uh, as you are able. Thank you for your offering given here today or through the church giving app. Please pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Another story of Jesus calling from John 4. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. God's call comes to us in so many ways. This next hymn recounts the stories of women in the Gospels and beyond who heard and followed their own calls, including the Samaritan woman that we just heard about. Hopefully you all remember this song from last summer. I think it was our theme song during a series last summer. It is on page 223 in the hymnal, Woman in the Night. We're going to modify it just a little bit. It's got eight verses, and that's a lot of singing, which we love to do, but we're going to modify it a little bit. So we're going to sing verse one, and then verse two, and then the refrain, and then three and four, and then the refrain. So we're coupling two verses and then the refrain. You'll catch on, I'm sure. I'm very confident in your abilities. So, woman in the night. We also need to say that it is not the tune that you're looking at. on a piece of paper right up here in the front. Yes, we are singing a different tune. So the if you're looking at your hymnal, you're just looking at the words. You're not looking at the the melody that we are singing. But the melody we are singing is the same one we did last summer. So, not to confuse you anymore or make it much more complicated. <laughs> Woman in the night, spent from giving birth, guard our precious light, pieces on the earth. Woman in the crowd, creeping up behind, touching is allowed, seek and you will find. Come and join the song, women, children, men. Jesus 
Christ makes us free to live again. Woman at the well, question the Messiah. Find your friends and tell, drink your heart's desire. Woman at the feast, let the righteous stare. Come and go in peace, love him with your hair. Come and join the song, women, children, men. Jesus makes us free to live again. Woman in the house, nurtured to be meek. Leave your second place, listen, think, and speak. Woman on the road, welcome and restore. makes us free to live again. Woman on the hill, stand when men have fled. Christ needs loving still, though your hope is dead. Woman in the dawn, care and spices bring. Early is to mourn, early is to see. Come and join the song, women, children, men. Jesus makes us free to live again. And one more call story for this morning from Acts Chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the, I, the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. The song that was in my head this week as I was preparing for this service, I got this feeling inside my bones. Some of you know where I was going with that. I can't stop the feeling. Thank you, Justin Timberlake. So we've all got these feelings, right? And, the, and they, they're kind of mysterious, but they seem to go really deep into our bones, these stirrings, these impulses that seem to invite us, draw us, beckon us. But how often do you actually listen to them? There's a recent television show on CBS 
that was just canceled this past year called God Friended Me. How many of you are, have seen any of that show? A few? Oh, yeah, a lot of you. It features a young man named Miles, who's the son of a minister, but who is also an adamant atheist. He does not believe in God, and he gets on his microphone and makes the weekly podcast called The Millennial Prophet, in which he explains all about how belief in God is wrong and dangerous. And then one day he gets a friend request on Facebook from the mysterious God account. And Miles thinks it's a joke. Someone is messing with him because they know he's an outspoken atheist. Like that's someone that God would want to befriend on Facebook. But then the God account keeps sending him friend suggestions. And Miles discovers that each person the account suggests is dealing with a problem that Miles and his friends can help with. Renters soon to be evicted, relationships broken, families needing hope, the lonely needing friends, the confused needing a reminder of what is right, injustice needing corrected. The God account doesn't always tell Miles what he needs to do, it just suggests people, names and faces. It's up to Miles to look into that name a little more. And Miles begins to trust the God account that seems to know things that nobody else knows. He comes to believe that the account is trying to help people. He's not quite sure it's really God. But maybe there is something to this helping other people thing. The account clearly wants to help people, and it wants to use Miles to do it, to make the world around him a better place. I'm reminded of the story of Philip in the book of Acts, who was met by a mysterious divine messenger who simply tells him, go south. That's it. Like the God account's friend suggestions, but even less specific. Just a direction. It's like God just showed up and said, start walking down that road, and you do it. God's calling doesn't always give us all the information. Just enough. Certain directions. Usually God doesn't warn us what we're about to face. So Philip heads off down the road, and kudos to Philip for obedience. And who should Philip find on the road but a chariot belonging to an Ethiopian eunuch, the treasurer of an African queen? Probably not at all what Philip was expecting to find. And the Spirit of God gives Philip one more piece of instruction. Stay nearby. That's it. Stay close. Stay alert. Be ready. Be ready for what? We'll see. It's almost as if God trusts that once Philip gets to where he needs to be, he will simply know what to do. Or maybe God trusts that Philip will understand when the time comes. God leaves certain details to us. We can improvise, be creative. Philip notices the African man is reading a piece of scripture, and Philip realizes that it's the Old Testament. And that's his in his opportunity to start up a conversation that would ultimately lead to the Ethiopian asking to be baptized and offering his life in service to Christ Jesus. Philip probably had no idea this was all going to happen when he woke up that morning. But he was ready to follow when the Spirit spoke, when the feeling in his bones started up, the nudge, the push, the pull, and others may have felt a, a spiritual nudge to go to the man on the road, but talked themselves out of obeying it. How often have we talked ourselves out of something that we really felt fairly strongly? After all, this was an Ethiopian eunuch serving foreign royalty. 
there are barriers here. Walls in their culture that divided, boundaries dangerous to cross. The man was a foreigner, a different race, a different color, a different sexual identity, one that the Jewish religion forbade associating with. But the feeling was still there. After their conversation, the Ethiopian declares, what is to stop me from being baptized? And at that point, Philip could have said, well, you're a eunuch and uncircumcised and a foreigner, so you probably can't join the new movement, sorry, and walked away. But Philip doesn't do that. Philip senses something else is more important than the laws and customs of his people. Love for one, and honoring this man's clear faith, and trusting that the Spirit has placed him in this, in this time, in this place, for this moment. When have we felt those feelings, those invitations, those nudges, those friend suggestions? Perhaps it's the same kind of feeling those four fishermen had last week when Jesus called them to leave their boats and lives behind, calling them to catch people with love instead of fish with nets. Jesus rarely calls people to make other people their projects. Our job is to catch them. God cleans them. God continues to work in people long after we've gone out of their lives. But each of us plays a role in the people that we encounter. Like the woman at the well, Jesus offers her living water, refreshing life, satisfying love like no other. There is an acknowledgement that she isn't perfect, but that's not the point. The point is trusting the feeling and following it to the source. That's all the woman needed. Once she realizes this strange man talking to her is the source of living water or life itself, she runs back into town to tell everyone. The feeling overtook her just as she was invited to know Christ, so she now invites others to know and be known by this guy, this life. Don't just take her word for it. Go and see for yourselves. See what Zacchaeus so longed to see up in the branches. See what the Ethiopian searched for in the scriptures. See what so overpowered Peter and Andrew, James and John, that they dropped everything to follow Jesus. See what Abraham and Moses and David and Esther and the prophets and Mary Magdalene found so liberating life-transforming, and world-changing. See what Paul saw on the road that made him a new man. Will you come and follow when that feeling seems to call your name? The summons is for each of us. Please join with us in singing the summons. Hopefully you have a song sheet or your electronic device so you can join with us.
who name themselves Christians are sent. We are messengers of the good kingdom news. Yet so often, like Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof, we respond to God's call, I know, I know, we are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Yet we have been chosen. As 1 Peter says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. May it be so. Go and love.